Hello, and welcome back to the Victory Road World Cup. We're on our second game in this um, Saturday running. I am Hayden McTavish, and I am joined by Evan Wang. How are you feeling, Evan? I'm doing good. And yeah, it's just a chill Saturday. We're trying to go through the weekend. But um, for the players in the World Cup, this is week two, and we're telling a lot of stories from the stream, from our broadcast, that like of the teams um, having to fight their way um, into the top two spots and some teams still being pretty comfortable. This week we are featuring more of the teams that are like they have to really just fight hard um, and win the matchup for the week. We saw an unfortunate story in the previous um, game and in the next one, in this one, the teams are just so close in their group and I'm very curious to see how this match plays out between these two strong players. Yeah, we've got quite a few, quite a bit of stakes on this next match, the Andres versus Kenneth. Um, the Netherlands is really on point to need to be able to win this match and this set, um, whereas Mexico is in a really good position. We're starting to get into that crunch again. Of there's only a couple more weeks before we advance to the next stage, and and two teams, half the teams will be eliminated, um, and so yeah. lots of crunch there. Um, and then uh, some very exciting matches with Julio versus Taran and Ryan versus Julian. Um, a rematch in that fourth one from last year's World Cup um, with plenty of stakes, and then um, two just phenomenal players in Julio and Taran being able to play each other. Yeah, so looking at this quick recap, yeah, I, I kind of understand why um, like a lot of casters say we want to see a game three, because a lot of these games have just been 2-0, and o, although there's, there's some back and forth within each match, but it's just so much more fun to, to cast a game with game three. So now, from now on, this is like what I'm hoping for to see um, in this match. So let's introduce both um, the countries. We have the Netherlands and Mexico. Netherlands actually lost a really close fight to South Korea, 3-5 to five last week. So this week, it it is to do or die. Being four points up against Mexico, 4-1 now, um, kind of secures a tie. So having one more win will just let Netherlands um, sort of heave a sigh of relief. From um, Mexico's side, in this group, we featured both um, their opponents yesterday, South Korea and, um, and, and Vietnam, I believe. And um, Mexico were able to defeat Vietnam 6-0 in a commanding fashion. But in, yeah, but from the screen that we see right now, they are down one and four. Yeah, so Netherlands needs this win and well on its way to potentially getting that, but there's still four more or three more sets and they do need to get a win in one of those. Uh, so it's going to be still a bit of pressure on Andres to be able to, to get that win and a lot of pressure on Kenneth Gamboa to be able to uh, bring that back and potentially Mexico could absolutely still tie this um, and that would put them in a much better position going forwards for getting one of those top two slots. Yeah, this group is seeming to be a very close group and I'm curious to see what these two players bring. Yeah, just now we saw all the teams. Um, you guys can see it in the website for yourselves, but I, I can feel that in this group stage, um, players are getting more serious and trying to bring teams that they're more comfortable with or teams that are tried and tested with good results. And speaking of results, um, here are both our players with a slew of good results um, in their resumes. So we said that both of these players are, they really need to take this seriously and they're definitely, they have the CVs to prove that they can do that. Um, we've got uh, Europe International's top 16 for Andres. That's incredibly impressive. And um, a number of other tournaments with finalists, top eights, top 16s, uh, definitely an accomplished player going more than five years back into Pokemon history. Um, Similarly, uh, at least half a decade of Pokemon on kind of Gamboa's side, um, champion of a tournament, uh, top fours at special events, top 16s, and a, a couple of different uh, championships. So definitely an accomplished player, no stranger to pressure matches, and definitely capable of starting to bring this back for Mexico. This will be fun. This will be a clash between the EU region, Netherlands, and the LATAM region with Mexico. Andreas is a uh, returning manager from World Cup last year, currently at a 2-1 record. Um, last, the previous two teams he used were Lunala and Groudon, so going more towards um, sort of the Europe style of play and being really bulky, but this time bringing Calyrex, Shadow and Groudon instead. From Kenneth's side, Kenneth is actually um, sort of a newcomer to the World Cup, but this year 
He is at 3 and 0 right now, so undefeated. Week 1 and week 2, he used Zashin and Ogre. Week 4, he used um, Karex, Ice, and Tokyo. And now he's coming in with a new team of Zashin and Iveltal. So, really interesting to see how these players have been prepping for each other. Yeah, interesting to see adjustments on both sides, sort of keeping one restricted the same and then swapping the others. Um, Definitely very exciting to see that Kenneth is undefeated and Andres has a solid positive record. Um, Definitely two players who've been doing really well in this tournament so far and playing for an awful lot of stakes. Um, We've also got the, (laughs) the, the great battle between the two gastrodons, East versus West. And I love that the players have chosen different kinds here to sort of see once and for all which one is better. Yeah, I just love it so much when our stream director puts the Pokemon facing each other. So we do have a mirror match of the Incineroar, Regilecki, and the Gastrodons from both sides of the world. So curious to see how this plays out. Um, I'm interested to see if that um, Charizard plays a role here, and at the same time, that Iveltal are being able to pressure that Kyrex Shadow with um, you know, four times super effective damage. Yeah, the two Airstream users, the two flying types, definitely seem like they could play a crucial role on either side. And it's definitely a question as to which side can use those better, or if other Pokemon end up coming, with those Regieleckis threatening the Veltal and the Charizard, respectively. Yep, so excited to see how this match plays out. One quick thing to note is that while Mexico just has been performing so well this season, and um, we remember back in week one when Mexico surprised all of us by going 8-0 against France. So let's see if in this match that they are being featured, whether they can continue that momentum. As we do see uh, um, um, Iveltal mm-hmm. and Whimsicott lead from Kenneth's side, going for like a lot of speed. And like you said, the flying types are like sort of putting in um, good work here and playing their roles, right? As the Charizard and Groudon comes in from Andres really offensively. Yeah, we said the flying types might be important and they're all on the field right at the start. Both sides starting with an awful lot of options for speed control. Um, we've got the Whimsicott too to make sure the Zivelto can go before the Charizard, which might be useful if you want to, to snarl or just be ahead of the game on airstreams. Um, this Groudon threatening a lot of pressure, but maybe not in a perfect position. We saw Kenneth sort of thinking about switching it. So I'm curious to see how this first turn plays out. There's a lot of pressure on one side and a lot of support on the other. Yeah, that's and- true. And there's a lot of like sort of items to kind of find out and players seem to be playing carefully. So from Andre's side, switching out the ground and maybe saving it for later and bringing that Incineroar in for fake out pressure. The Dynamax goes off first, but that's a nice um, cherished ball from this Charizard. So this is a gift Charizard. It's going big and um, I'm yeah interested to see if Kenneth tries like Dynamaxes the Iveltal on the other hand and if it pulls an interesting item like the Life Orb to be able to help itself as we do see Dynamax here. Yeah, so Iveltal um, Dynamaxing as well. The flying types are here. The flying types are Dynamaxing turn one. They're ready to provide some speed control if they need to or just start doing some damage. Um, interesting to see, as you mentioned, that Incineroar switching in, uh, potentially trying to catch an attack that might have been aimed at that Groudon, or just give some support to slow down that Whimsicott. Iveltal actually going for the Max Guard on turn 1, potentially trying to catch that Wildfire, and Whimsicott setting up the Tailwind, so there's now the speed advantage on Kenneth's side of the field. We'll have to see where this Charizard's Wildfire goes in, and it is into the Max Guard, so that's, that's a really good prediction from Kenneth, slowing this Charizard down by a whole turn of its Dynamax, um, and getting that tailwind up so that Igalto can move first now. Yeah, I like that play, but interesting to see that Kenneth doesn't just go offensive immediately and take advantage of that first turn of tailwind. So um, I, this play kind of is pretty neutral, but um, being able to like set up tailwind for the future. And if Andres were to target the Whimsicott with, say, a G-Max Wildfire, then a Pokemon gets to come in upon the free switch and um, pressure so much more damage. The only damage being taken here is that Charizard's um, solar power. So, yeah, I'm curious to see what goes on in the next turn, especially when the Incineroar has fake out pressure. We see the Helping Hand um, kind of predicting the fake out, and sure enough, um, the Helping Hand goes first, and that just gives Iveltal so much power. The next Airstream goes into the Incineroar, and while you don't see this every day, is able to take the Incineroar out with a clean one hit KO. 
So we get to see maybe why that Whimsicott wanted to stagger and Tailwind well develop the Max Guarded so that it could do something this turn when you go offensive. And it gets that helping hand with the Life Orb on Max Airstream and this Incineroar is just gone. Wildfire is going to come back into the Sibelto, it's going to do a lot of damage, but it's not a KO, and so the Sibelto is going to get to use its third turn of Dynamax just fine, um, and it has a whole lot of pressure next to this Helping Hand Whimsicott. As the Wildfire goes through, we are going to see some reduced HP, but the Sibelto can definitely take another one or two of those. Yeah, and Sibelto went for uh, Max Airstream, interestingly, so um, it's just going to be really fast and have good control. Maybe you can start um, like switching the Zashin in to give an Airstream boost there. Uh, we also saw the items from both Eveltal and okay, Charizard, the lack thereof, but Eveltal has that life orb and with that helping hand, just wow, it's so oppressive on the field and just naturally so bulky to be able to survive that max wildfire in the sun. Oh, here yes. comes another helping hand. Uh, Wimscott just doing the same thing as it did before, making sure this Evelto can do as much damage as possible in Dynamax. Charizard's going to try to Max Guard, but it does not call the Evelto's target incorrectly. Um, and this Max Darkness just completely gets rid of this Groudon, and that Charizard didn't get to attack on its last turn of Dynamax, and is now at reduced special defense. So a huge read from Kenneth. That's so much momentum, and it's down to just two Pokemon on Andre's side of the field. Such a cool gambit, like going for max guard, then max move, max move. But the two max moves coming out from Yveltal took two clean KOs, so commanding, and really just forced Andres to be defensive here and actually catches the max guard on the Charizard, which is unfortunate. It was really interesting to see how Dynamax was used there for the Yveltal side of the field. That like. That it was really just sort of to make sure that you had the survivability to take that one attack from Charizard, um, then be able to take like the second because you've got Max Guard and then the survival, and then having exactly the damage you need to get those KOs. I think it's a really good demonstration of all the different benefits you get from Dynamaxing other than the sort of sat effects. And so it was really neat to see that. And we're going to have to see on this last turn of Tailwind if Kenneth can continue the onslaught or if there's a chance for Andres to maybe pivot things a little bit while using that Wildfire. Yep, so the Gashodon comes in on Andres' side and we do see the third helping hand here just making full use of that um, Tailwind. Charizard goes for a double protect and gets it since Ivelta is kind of on its last breath here and will go down to the Wildfire. So catches it, um, the Oblivion Wing does not go into the um, Charizard and an Ice Beam from the Gashodon is able to take Whimsicott out. Do there, will we see a West Sea, a pink Gashodon on Kenneth's end? <laughs> so, such a huge shift of momentum there, getting that double protect, preventing Ivelto from healing enough to survive the wildfire, and suddenly we're down to 2-2 two -two and there's no more Tailwind on Kenneth's side of the field, so there was so much offense, um, and now it's really all up to Kenneth's last two Pokémon. You do get the Zashin, but it doesn't have super strong attacks into either of these two Pokémon, other than just being a Zashin, the listed attacks go do a lot, and we do see the Kenneth on the side. That's amazing! <laughs> Wow, it's so interesting um, for both players to opt to bring their Gastrodons when um, there are no like like Kyogres or Palkias on the opposing end. So curious to see how these um, two Gastrodons interact. And Zashan being the fastest Pokemon here, Tailwind has ended on Kenneth's side, really has to put in good damage into the Charizard um, before going down. And I have a feeling we might see a Gastrodon face off in the end game. <laughs> <laughs> We're definitely going to get that Battle of East versus West Gastrodon if that happens. Um, but yeah, an interesting point that Zashin is the fastest, but there's a lot of onus on it to be able to do enough damage to sort of justify its presence on the field, not just get KO'd by the Charizard. There is still that last turn of Wildfire damage too on Andre's side. Um, and we do see Zashin just going for Protect, maybe stalling for some Solar Power damage, Gastrodon also going for Protect. Um, and But we will see that Wildfire still going out and doing damage. Blast Burn into the Protect. Um, we're going to see what Gastrodon decided its best bet was. Looks like it's a yawn into the other Gastrodon. We might be here for a while. Um, but we are going to see the Harsh Sunlight fading, which is a pretty big deal for um, reducing that Charizard's damage. But it also means Charizard doesn't take the recoil damage from Solar Power, whereas Wildfire does go off on Gastrodon and Sasha. Oh, that's an interesting dichotomy. But I believe Kenneth has been counting his sun turns right. And it does make sense to stall the sun out from the Charizard. And we do see the Charizard 
go for that blast burn into the Zashan slots. So it would have been a clean KO, but this time it could be a roll if your Zashan is trained to be really bulky. And at the same time, blast burn could have a chance to miss. Wow, we have a little sneak peek on Andres' moveset in that the Charizard actually prepares both the blast burn and the heat wave. This is a really good call from Andres because Charizard is the most important Pokemon to take out, but with the Protect from the Charizard, Kenneth kind of reads it and goes for the Substitute here and does not get affected by, uh, will not get affected by Andres' Yawn. Man, these Gastronauts are going for Yawn. Yeah, so Andres' one doesn't pull through, but the pink Gastrodon, ding ding ding, <laughs> manages to get the Yawn off onto the blue Gastrodon. You heard it here first, pink Gastrodon's falling ahead. <laughs> um, but that Zacian Substitute was such a huge reveal here because even if that Charizard had attacked, if it had gone for that Blast Burn, then it would have gotten rid of the Substitute, yes, but then been unable to move the next turn. Mm -hmm. This was a tight spot for Zacian if it couldn't get the KO on Charizard, but suddenly it's now in so much better of a position. And it can just protect, wait for that Gastrodon to go to sleep, and it's in such a good position. Wow, Kenneth is just playing so carefully here, alternating attacks between protects, but just catching that Charizard off, because if the Charizard goes for a heat wave like we do see here, Charizard can protect again next turn, and it just comes down to just like a back and forth of when um, you predict your opponent is going to attack here. So both players just playing really, really carefully with like two Pokemon left on um, their side of the field. Yeah, unfortunately, like um, Andres's. Gastron has to take the bullet, isn't able to get another yawn off and gets to go to sleep here and has to take one sleep turn on this next turn. I'm really loving seeing this end game play from kind of very careful mm -hmm. making sure this Gastron gets leftovers recovery back up fall, this Zacian now has a substitute up, you can try to get this KO on Charizard, although it's going to protect this turn, um, but you no longer have to rely on that happening because you've got the substitute up. We do see Behemoth Blade just going into the protect on the Charizard, Gastron gets a chance to start trying to wake up but it does have to take an Earth Power for its effort. If this gets a special defense drop, that would be huge. It does not. So there's still a way for Andres back into this game, potentially. Um, but we are still counting on that Charizard. It would have to survive a Behemoth Blade and then break the Substitute. And then somehow Gastrodon would have to take out a separate Gastrodon and also the Zacian. Looking really tough for Andres based on how well Kenneth has played this. True, but in the previous turn, I thought Kenneth could have easily gone for like the double up into the gastrodon the blue gastrodon to be able to take it out sooner but unfortunately catches the beam of it since the in the Zashan is safe behind the substitute right so beam of it comes in here ah isn't able to take the charizard out and charizard gets to move uh, on this turn goes for the heat wave is able to do meaningful damage into both pokemon but just uh the damage into the gastrodon is quite sad because charizard is not boosted in the sun Oh, we do get the burn, and that's such a huge <laughs> deal. Now this Gastrodon can't go to sleep. It loses yeah. the recovery, but it can't be on. Um, and it gets to do the Icy Wind to finish off that Charizard. What an interesting move. Um, so a huge development there, and then with without Gastrodon waking up this turn, it can't pick up the KO on Zashin. So that sort of seems to be sealing Andre's fate here. Yeah, pink Gastrodon being fancy here today. Um, <laughs> getting a burn from the Heat Wave, and at the same time revealing a super interesting move in Icy Wind. And Kenneth's team just really screams speed control, so that is good information coming out from Andres. And I'm curious to know why, like, um, Gastrodon didn't do any other move. Um, probably like Earth Power to keep pressuring the other Gastrodon and chooses to um show Icy Wind on this turn. So both players are getting really good information on each other's teams. Yeah, I think it's really interesting for Kenneth to sort of recognize maybe there is still a way that I don't win this game. Um, if Gastrodon had woken up and taken out Sashin with an Earth Power you might have needed that speed drop on the other Gastrodon to have the edge. Yeah. And so just like willing to get information to have this end game really guaranteed. Um, we will see if Zashin can just keep going for substitutes, um, is going to be able to survive that earth power. Meanwhile, the poor blue Gastrodon has to take so many attacks from the other side of the field. And we're going to be seeing both of these players sort of transitioning to thinking about, okay, I know some information from my opponent. I know how this game played out. How do I adjust going forwards? True, and then from Andres' side, he must be thinking, okay, I know that this um, Earth Power is able to take that Zashan substitute out, but really, really careful play by Kenneth all the way in this end game, going for a substitute from the Zashan instead of going for outright attack and just kind of hiding the bulk on the Zashan to not show how much um, a pure Earth Power can go into the Zashan from Kenneth's side. Finally, going for the Sacred Sword to deal that finishing blow, but I think just so well managed by 
um, Kenneth and such an interesting place with that turn one next card all the way to the end, um, the protect, protect and also that substitute reveal. So that just helped the Zashen Ivelto team so much in this matchup. I think there's a lot of there's a lot of temptation in that sort of a situation to just click Behemoth Blade and hope it KOs the Charizard. And we saw here that it didn't. And if Kenneth had just gone for that right away, uh, he would have been in a really bad position because uh, his Gastrodon would have taken some recoil from the Wildfire. Um, it would have had to contend with the Yawns from the other Gastrodon. It would have been in just a really tough position and having to rely on some luck with sleep. And so instead, finding a way to position this into, okay, I can get rid of the Sun, I can set up my substitutes, I can protect, I can heal my Gastrodon back up from the Wildfire. It was really interesting to see sort of, we saw the crazy offensive play with the first two Pokemon from Kenneth, and then the really careful, intricate defensive play with the last two Pokemon. And so Kenneth's shown that he can do both modes, and I'm curious what we'll see going forwards. Yeah, that's such a good point. And I'm so impressed with like just the whimsy caught. Uh, maybe being protected by the Focus Sash, but always able to go for Helping Hand, Helping Hand, to just help the Iveltal destroy things. So, um, Pink Gastrodon is actually up 1 and 0 oh now, so I don't, I'm not sure if there are more Pink Gastrodon or Blue Gastrodon's uh, fans in chat. But yeah, I, I just want that Blue Gastrodon to try and fight back and, and win another match, since the Blue Gastrodon, like, in that team composition, <laughs> I'm talking about, like, aesthetics here, it just looks really nice, because you have, like, Groudon, Insane, Charizard, um, orange, and then Gastron is blue and um, green to complement the team. What do you Gastron think? Um, yeah, what do you think both players can do um, um, to adjust for game two? Oh no, same lead. So Kenneth sort of not seeing a reason to adjust from before, but we do see the Reggie like coming out um, from Andre's side of the field. And that's a really big deal because we've got a lot of damage potential into that Eveltal now. Um, we mentioned before that the electric types might be instrumental in handling the two flying type Dynamaxes. And with that Incineroar 2, you're able to block the Tailwind on turn one. And so this Regilecki has at least a turn where it's going to be convincingly faster than this Eveltal and might be able to do some damage into it or try to go for a read and do some damage into the Whimsicott. Um, a whole lot of momentum coming up from Andre's side of the field sort of saying, I, I know you don't have a reason to adjust from before, I'm going to show you a reason here. Yeah, good point. And a complete switch up from the Charizard and Groudon lead back in game one. I guess if the um, Reggie like he has the option to max S stream, and if you are confident with your uh, damage calculations, you might go for a fake out plus S stream into the Whimsicott to take it out once and for all and remove Tailwind from play altogether. But just Ivelta is just so naturally bulky, and if Ivelta, with the life orb that we have seen in game one, were to go for a retaliation attack into the Reggie Lecky, then it's just a very explosive game one, and it just comes down to positioning all the way towards the end game. As we do see Andres pull the plug, Dynamax this Reggie Lecky, and it's bouncing happily on the field now. Um, so Reggie Lecky going to Dynamax, Ivelta going to Dynamax too. Well, I'll turn one Dynamax is so far this set. Um, there's a really important turn here where we know, I, Kenneth does not yet know, that there was a fake out and an airstream into that Whimsicott. Um, but if this Whimsicott goes for Helping Hand and manages to work around the fake out, this Ivelto yeah. could just take a huge KO this turn. And so there's a huge prediction on this first game, and we're going to have to see how this goes. And we see that Whimsicott doesn't go for Helping Hand, but Ivelto also didn't protect. So sort of like a 50-50 in terms of the, the gains here. Yeah, such an interesting like edit, um, difference from game one, the max airstream is able to take the um, red, the Whimsicott out with a critical hit. And this Evel um, this Reggie Ileki seems to be a mixed set, so not sure if that mattered, but Whimsicott is um, usually not trained in bulk. And Reggie Ileki also shows the life orb. So here comes the max darkness from the Evelta going into the Reggie Ileki without the helping hand. He's easily able to take a clean KO on Reggie Ileki with that you know mediocre um, HP stat. It just goes down like that on turn one. It's sort of a repeat of events from the the first game of this stream. Um, kind of making me eat my words there, saying I don't need the helping hand, Hayden. I can just KO mm -hmm. this Regilecki, and that's such a huge benefit. Like not going for that protect on the Evelto, even though it was a bit threatened, make sure that even though you lose Whimsicott and you don't get Tailwind up, you've taken out the Dynamax on turn one, and you've still got so much damage you can do with your Evelto. I think like. Really interesting to have Andre zoom in on the Whimsicott, seeing how much of a problem it was before, and going for that defensive play with the Beltle, making you think, oh, I can't just target into it. And then adjusting game two was really impressive. Yeah, and 
it doesn't matter if the whimsical were to go down. I feel like kind of Steam just really screams speed control. He really has a good game plan in general to um, control the speeds and make sure he has the faster Pokemon being attacked first. Uh, being able to attack first. Sashen comes in, Sashen immediately goes for that substitute to bypass the Yawn. No way, that, that's just a pure Max Airstream with Life Orb into the Incineroar and it doesn't take it. So. Yeah, no critical hit as well. Incineroar just goes down like that. Let's see what um, the Gashuron does. Correctly goes for the Yawn into the Ivelto, but Andres is just down to his last two Pokemon, and it's so difficult to find a way out here. I've never been more terrified of a Pokemon than I am of this Ivelto. That's an incredible two KOs. Um, sort of, we saw Kenneth using Helping Hand the whole first game, and Andres being like, okay, as long as I get rid of the Helping Hand, <laughs> I can handle the Ivelto. And then uh, Ken is just showing, I didn't actually need Helping Hand half the time. This is so much pressure, and this Goshen being able to capitalize on that is such a big deal with the Substitute. Um, it's now able to go for a Behemoth Blade and not worry so much about retaliation. So there's going to be a whole lot of damage, probably into that Groudon, um, taking it down below half health, and this Veltal could definitely pick up the KO on that Groudon, um, or do a lot of damage to the Gastrodon. Um, and it's setting up that special defense drop on the Gastrodon, even though it's going to go asleep now, if it, if it ever wakes up, uh, it's, this Gashadon's in for a world of hurt. Yeah, that makes sense. And unlike last game, Kenneth being uh, playing um, carefully towards the end game, Kenneth is now like, you know, it, the Zashan is safe behind the substitute, and you do know your both your Pokemon are definitely faster. So immediately just going for pure damage into the Groudon to easily be able to take it out. Ivalta actually goes to sleep here, but yeah, like that's okay, right? Since Iveltal is naturally really bulky and Gashiron not known to have a lot of special attack and Kenneth still has another Pokemon in the back to be able to um, continue to put on so much pressure onto this Gashiron, the poor little blue Gashiron on Andres' side. I think like the, the matchup seems to really be in Kenneth's favor with that Whimsicott and just with um, generally faster Pokemon to always be able to attack first. Yeah, a lot of attacking first with a lot of damage, and now we see, now that this Gastron is down to just the one slot against two, the Zashin can just keep clicking Substitute, um, and this Gastron has to target into the Zashin to stop it. But because there's two Pokemon on kind of side of the field, mm -hmm. and he effectively gets two turns to Gastrodon's every one, you can just repeat the Substitute, and if Gastron ever deviates from its play, um, it the Zashin's going to be protected the next turn. I'm uh, definitely seeing one of the many reasons why Substitute is a terrifying move in double battles. Mm -hmm, so well said, and... Substitute just buys Sashen, you know, like essentially four tickets to always be able to um to, to survive and at the same time allow the Ivelto to um have chances of waking up and he does wake up and goes for that life orb dark pulse. I have a, like a nagging feeling that this is a modest um Ivelto instead of the more common um timid Ivelto with a plus um speed nature since I myself ran Ivelto in NAIC and I, I made the last minute like wild call to run Modus and he's been taking really good KOs and I'm really enjoying it quite a lot. So um once again like the um Zashen and Ivelto just proving to be really demanding uh, sorry really commanding for Kenneth in this second game. Yeah um we saw Zashin, we saw we saw Iveltal attack four times in that game and take four KOs. Oh, wow. and that was, that's what that's what Iveltal did. Um, so definitely, if that is modest, definitely putting in a whole lot of work. Such impressive play from Kenneth, showing why he is undefeated, and possibly putting a little bit of life back into Mexico on this very crunch week that, like, now you were down 4-1, but now you're at 4-2, or down 4-2, but you still got just two more sets now to tie things up. And I think so much momentum is present on a team if you're able to get um, a win from a really tight spot. There's just so much faith in your teammates and ability to move forwards. And so awesome to see Kenneth sort of making Netherlands really work for that win and potentially bringing things back um, for Mexico to be able to tie. I'd love to see a comeback, a nice comeback. And Mexico has just been doing well all season long um, from qualifiers up to the group stage now. So good luck to the other two um, like the other four players playing the remaining two matches for this particular matchup. Um, for this week, we managed to feature all four groups from this group. Um, sorry, all four teams from this group seven. So interesting to kind of um, let everyone know how the story is like in this aspect. So our next match, our next match is the kind of the one that everybody is waiting for. This will be Taran Birdi from the United Kingdom versus Giulio Talao from Italy. You don't want to miss it. Don't go away.